So we've been talking about the Hodgkin Huxley model in previous videos, and in this video I just wanted to go over some code that I posted on my website and show you the output of that code so you can interpret what's going on if you play with it, and it'll give you a feel for what the Hodgkin Huxley model does. So in blue, on the top two rows, I have the membrane potential of the neuron. So here we have a neuron that's silent and begins to spike tonically at a constant rate. This is the time domain over on the left side of the screen. And on the right side, we have the frequency domain. And I've explained that in a previous video. So on the bottom, I, so the output is sort of on the top uh, row. And on the bottom row, I have the uh, input to the cell. So this is, uh, this is current that I'm injecting into the cell. And the top row is the memory potential. So <clears throat> what you can see here is I'm just injecting a step of current. And when I inject depolarizing or inward current, uh, 10 nanoamps, that excites the cell and the cell begins to spike uh, exactly at the onset of the current step. So this is very different than what we saw in a passive membrane. A passive membrane just exponentially approaches some steady state. But here, the cell begins to spike, and that's because of all the active voltage-dependent currents that are in this model. So this is a highly nonlinear system, whereas before we were looking at a simple linear system that could be fit with an exponential. So this is another example. Uh, my code can be run in several different modes with different parameters. So before I was injecting a step of current, now I'm injecting pink noise, which again is in red on the bottom. The output of the cell, which is in blue on the top, is again a series of spikes, but now the cell is not spiking continuously, but it spikes uh, sort of in random bursts. So when the pink noise, for example, comes to a peak, uh, or there's a lot of depolarizing current over a short period of time, then the cell will fire many action potentials, whereas periods where the current is sort of at a trough, the membrane potential um, is sort of silent as well. And note that to understand this model, you can get some intuition from the passive membrane examples that we've been going over. So remember when we injected pink noise into a passive membrane, we saw that the membrane act as a low-pass filter. And you can still see that in the sub-threshold behavior of this model here. So the sub-threshold membrane potential, essentially anything below this line, anything when the cell is not spiking, is essentially a low-pass filtered version of this red uh, input trace, or it, it's at least close enough that that intuition is still good to keep in mind. So unlike in our previous simulations of the passive neuron membrane, the hodgkin huxley model has several dynamic variables that are changing over time. Before we just had the membrane potential of the cell, we have we now have activation and inactivation gating variables for sodium and potassium current. So I just wanted to drive this home in these plots here. So in these plots, the black dotted lines are the membrane potential that I was showing before in blue. So that, that's the voltage of the cell. So these, blue, these uh, spikes here are the action potentials. And in green, I'm showing the potassium activation, and in blue, the sodium activation. And what you can see here is that both of these currents become active during the spikes, or, and actually their activation, in the case of sodium, causes the spike, the upswing of the spike, and the activation of potassium helps repolarize the membrane potential. So that's the falling phase. So you can see that the sodium activation in this model is much uh, quicker than the potassium activation. Uh, the blue lines are much skinnier than the green lines. And that separation of time scales is important because if the sodium was too slow, then it would never create the positive feedback loop that's necessary to begin the action potential. Essentially, you need sodium to dominate early in the action potential phase and potassium to dominate in the latter part. And there's a third gating variable that we have to consider, which is the inactivation of sodium. And this one I wanted to show separate because it's sort of opposite of the previous two. So here, the red, again, showing the gating variable. And every time the red dips corresponds to an action potential. So again, the black lines are the membrane potential of the cell, and the red is the gating variable. So when the red is close to the top, that corresponds to channels being open, and down the, the gate is closed. So importantly, before an action potential begins, a lot of the inactivation gates are open. So for example, here, gates are open, and that precedes the action potential. So because the inactivation gates are open, that allows the activation gates here to come open and begin the action potential. Once the action potential begins, the so, uh, potassium activation 
uh, also starts, which helps repolarize the membrane. And in addition, the inactivation gates for sodium begin to close, which also helps uh, repolarize and begin the downward or falling phase of the action potential.